Well, um, welcome here to all of you. My name is Magnus Hagender. Uh, I work for a company called Red Bull Linpro. We're a, an open source company in Scandinavia, based in uh, Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, myself, I'm part of the Postgres core team. Uh, I am one of the committers who will see. I don't think I have a feature of my own in Postgres 17 yet, but you know, it's not too late. Uh, and I currently serve as the president of the board of Postgres Europe. Um, but we're here to talk about Postgres 17, right? Who's already using Postgres 17? Okay, good. Who's using it in production? Very good. How's it working out for you? <laughs> Perfect. <clears throat> so yeah, I, uh, Postgres 17 is at this point still the upcoming version of Postgres, right? The uh, current latest and greatest that is supposed to be used in production is Postgres 16. Who's on Postgres 16 in production? Okay, let's see. 15? 14? See, so far the numbers are going down. I'm worried when this trend is going to change. 13? 12? 11? Okay, now we're getting into troublesome area. 10? Earlier than 10. Okay, well, I don't need to tell you that you should fix that. <laughs> You probably know that already. Uh, and, and if it was easy, you would have done it. Um, but yeah, as of, of today, the latest supported version of Postgres is 12. Uh, and the newest supported version of Postgres is 16. 17 is not yet supported. But 17 is the upcoming version, right? Uh, and the way that we work uh, in Postgres when we build is that we actually started Postgres 17 in June of last year by branching Postgres 16. Because the way the development works within Postgres is we do all the new feature development uh, against the master branch. And then when we feel it's you know, nice and ready and stable and the new one, we create a branch. In this case, we call it release 16 stable. And that's how you magically make your software stable. Just create a branch name with a stable in its name and you should be good to go. Uh, but, you know, jokes aside, what that means is the moment, so in June 2023, we branch, we created the branch called Release 16 Stable, and what that really means is you're not allowed to put any new features onto that branch anymore. It's now bug fixes and, and maintenance only, and the master branch, the main development branch, gets opened up for building new features and then starting adding the features that will eventually bring us to Postgres 17. <coughs> Then in Postgres, we work with something that we call commit fests. It's really just our way of doing iterative developments. You can call it whatever you want, but we chose the name commit fests because nobody else had used it, and of course, we wanted our own name. But the idea is we spend one month building and contributing features to Postgres, then we spend one month reviewing and committing them onto the main branch. So the idea here is the first commit fest for Postgres 17 was in July, that would then in theory, would be things built in June, uh, and if it worked all the way through. Then we had another one in September, we had another one in November, we had one in January, and we are currently in the middle of the fifth commit fest, which is for March, which will be the last one. So the way we do it, you know, these two month cycles until March, and then we just stop. So at the end of this commit fest five, which is currently in progress, when that one finishes, that's the feature freeze uh, for version 17. It's a very long commit fest. <laughs> We're going to get so many features in. Yeah, I probably did. Because I, I kind of copied that and added one to everything. <laughs> So no, it is it is March 2024. Yes, um, and so and I think we we're typically setting about a week a week to ten days into April is when the official feature freeze uh, for 17 is. Building on that, we'll stabilize that and eventually get to a beta version. Usually around May-ish, we'll see how many beta versions there will be. We'll see when we get to release candidate. But the general target is to try to get a release out in the September to October timeframe as usual. As you know, if you've been around Postgres for a while, that's when we usually try uh, to get the new major versions out. But that also means that as a disclaimer, where we are now today may be completely different from where we are three weeks from now. Uh, 
we know that nothing will get added that nobody has submitted yet, but there are hundreds of things in the queue that we don't know which of them are going to make it in. So this will be a preview. And the same thing, of course, right up until release, any of these features can be removed. Uh, if it's determined that you know, it's not good enough, it runs into a corner case that cannot you know, reasonably be fixed within the time frame of the release. Uh, this has happened a few times around. It happened in the last version that some things were removed after the beta version was out, and then they got removed again. And some of them are back now uh, in 4.17. So the almost current status that we're at, because I think this number is from yesterday, and you know, for some reason there's not a freeze around when I do these presentations, so it's hard to keep up. And I, I updated this sometime last night, not this morning. But at that point we were looking at, uh, in this case, as you can see, you know, as we all know, these are the best ways to measure developer productivity. Uh, we were at 1,600 commits with about 150,000 lines of new code. Um, and about half as much deleted. So where, what is this then? What kind of features are we? What are we looking for? Um, for those of you who've seen my presentations before, you see I usually divide them into a couple of sections just to have a, a little uh, area. So we got DBA and admin, we got SQL and developer, um, backup and replication, and then we'll finish off about talking a little bit about performance because everybody loves performance. Uh, and there, of course, every Postgres version has some interesting stuff. But let's start with breaking changes. Right. What are we breaking for you? Hopefully not that much, but probably something. Actually, I'm willing to say hopefully something. Because if, if you're not affected by any of this, then you are not doing the things that you should be doing. Uh, but probably not the first ones, uh, which is, for example, uh, we have a different way of building Windows builds now. You, have, you can no longer use our manual, really ugly, hacked up scripts. You have to use Mison. <laughs> That's a good thing. We dropped AIX support. Who used... Who uses Postgres on AIX? Who has ever used Postgres on AIX? Who has ever used AIX? Okay, there we go. <laughs> At least something, right? Um, and we've also removed, this is one of those you know, double negations, we've re re removed the ability to remove thread safety. Uh, I don't think anyone turned off thread safety for many, many years. So these things should hopefully not mean that much to you. Uh, a couple of other things that you may have been using. The admin pack uh, contrib module is gone. Uh, all the functionality in that module already exists in Postgres core. But if you had code or if you had modules that were using it, you just have to change them to use the functionality that's already in Postgres core. Uh, has anyone ever used DB user namespace? It's a, a configuration parameter that you can turn on. Okay, I'm glad. Basically, the idea behind this one was you could uh, have different users in different databases in the same instance. The minor drawback was you could no longer have encrypted passwords at all. Everything was clear text. So I'm glad you didn't use this. Uh, and this is why it has been removed. Uh, did anyone use the Postgres snapshot too old feature? Did you have a good experience with it? Uh, yeah, it, it had uh, far too many quirks and it didn't really work very well and it was getting basically unmaintained. So, it's gone. Okay, these are things that I was hoping you weren't using. Uh, has anyone ever read from PG Stat BG Writer? I, sh I hope all of you have done that. Maybe not directly, but maybe with your monitoring tool. So, a few things are gone. The columns for checkpoints time, checkpoints requested, write time, sync time, buffers checkpoint back and uh, buffers back end and back end fsync are all gone from this view. So, all your monitoring software will break. Sorry. Uh, what it's going to mean, of course, is that you need to upgrade your monitoring software to a version that supports version 17. Uh, but most monitoring software will be reading from this view. And it's, it's vastly different in this version. The other thing that I hope is not going to break for you, but it might, is that the search path variable in Postgres is now by default secured in all functions called in maintenance operations. What the hell does that mean? Uh, well, the basic idea is, there, there are a few other covers, but the simple case is if you have an expression index, right? you have an index on the result of a function. When that function, by default now, when that function is executed, Postgres will reset the search path variable to just contain PG catalog. If you need that function to be able to call fun other functions 
that are not in PG Catalog, you have to explicitly change, set the search path on the function. Otherwise, it will stop working, right? Because it will not find the functions. Previous versions of Postgres would use whatever search path you were in, at which point the maintenance operation could become very, it's very easy to build yourself a security footgun, uh, where you could basically allow code execution as other users by placing things in different schemas and stuff. So the, the hard code thing here is if you don't do anything, everything will become secure because it will restrict it to PG Catalog and regular user can never put functions in PG Catalog. Uh, but it also means that if you are using expression index on your own functions that are, are calling out, you will need to go and explicitly set uh, the search path for them. Hopefully, you were already doing that. In reality, you probably weren't. Uh, and now you will. So if you are using, again, expression index on custom functions that call out to other functions, they will likely break. You just need to investigate it unless you're doing something really dumb, <laughs> which you shouldn't be doing, then all you need to do is to do the you know, alter function set search path and it will work again, but you've just changed what the hard coding value is. Uh, so these are basically the breaking changes I've found so far. Let's talk about the new stuff instead, right? You didn't all just come here to, you, you don't upgrade to 17 just to get things broken, right? A little bit, I mean, some things are actually good. Some of these breaking things are good, but on general, no. So let's start talking about the area of DBA and administration. We'll start with a small one that I think people who are using it are going to like it a lot. Who's using, well, let's start by who's using PSQL. Surprisingly few, actually. Do you know that in PSQL you can do this backslash watch, which is the same as, as watch in Unix, like run this query over and over again and show me the result? Uh, the new thing here is you can just give it a parameter that says when it stop when it drops below. So if you run your query and you do this, you know, backslash watch, m equal two, it'll run until the number of rows returned is less than two and then it'll stop. So it's kind of neat if you're polling some sort of a background job who goes, who's ever done that? You know, polling, you know, PG stat progress vacuum, put it on the backslash watch, vacuum finishes, and then the interesting data starts scrolling off the screen and out of your um, scroll back buffer before you notice. I've certainly done that. <laughs> so small things, very useful. Uh, other things that I think are going to be quite useful but, uh, but are fairly small is there is yet another timeout. We've had many, many timeouts in Postgres. You have statement timeouts and session timeouts and idle in transaction timeout, and now we have a transaction timeout. It is really what it says. If you set transaction timeout to one minute, no transaction is allowed to run for more than one minute, regardless of what it's doing. Right? A statement timeout applies to the individual query, but this one you can say, one minute for a transaction, whether it's a million queries or one query, we don't care, stop after one minute. Uh, the typical user or a typical use case for this can be if you have, you know, you have a classic web app, you got a web request coming in, you're gonna time out that web request at some point anyway, and then the query is gonna keep running. <laughs> but setting a statement timeout for that is really hard because you might have multiple queries, right? Now you can just match up this timeout to set it to you know, a second or two longer than your web server timeout, and then it'll just clean up the old queries when there is not gonna be anyone listening for the result anyway. All right. Excuse me, if you, can you define this on a per user basis? Yes. It's like the other timeout sessions. Yes. Can you change it per session? Yes. You can change it pretty much everywhere. Uh, in the same places as uh, the statement timeout. Um, who's using event triggers in Postgres? Okay, no, not too many. So event triggers are, you know, the triggers that normal triggers trigger based on data. Event triggers based on well, events. Uh, but you can have them fire on things like create table. You can have them fire on DDL and log it or prevent it and things. And uh, at the simplest, you can now also. They fire, there's a, you can create a trigger whenever re-index runs and make things happen. And the, the more debated one is you can also have a login event trigger, which means you can now get a trigger that runs when a user logins to the system. Or, as we like to call it, a footgun extraordinaire. Uh, you need to be very careful if you write one of these because if your event trigger crashes, for example, nobody can log into your database, including you. So you can no longer fix your event trigger. Uh, 
So yeah, you, I mean, actually you can because you can also know there is a global parameter where you can just globally turn off all event triggers so that you can get in and fix your login event trigger. But yeah, it is. You, you can do classic things like if the event trigger writes anything, nobody will, ever be, oops, sorry, nobody will ever be able to log into one of your standbys again because the event trigger runs, it tries to write. You can't write anything on a standby, so it crashes. So you can do very good things with login event triggers, and you can do very bad things. <laughs> it is a big foot gun, but if it's used right, it can be very powerful. You can, do, you can get connection auditing at a level that the, the built-in one isn't enough. You can add policies of uh, you know, who can do what, who can log into what, assigning roles at login. There's a whole bunch of things you can do, but be very, very careful. <laughs> Because again, something goes wrong, and it goes wrong for real, and you're stuck. Um, hopefully everybody by now has learned the idea of weight events. Uh, if you went to uh, Jeremy's talk yesterday, he did a good example of why you should be looking at your weight events. Uh, They've been around in Postgres since version 10. We renamed all of them a couple of versions ago just to confuse you. Uh, and now we renamed them then, but only now did we actually create a new view called PG Wait Events that will actually tell you what they are. <laughs> uh, so when we rename them the next time, you can find them. Uh, but no, so basically you now have a view that's called PG Wait Events. It really is you know, the, the event type, the name, and a small description so that you can find it obviously for the version that you're in. And one other important reason for this one is that wait events can now also get custom wait events for extensions. Uh, previously, there was a single wait event for extensions that just said it's waiting on an extension. Uh, but as of 17, an extension can register their own wait events, which will then show up in this PG wait events uh, so that the, you can see what it's waiting for inside of the extension as well. Um, Another thing that I always like about Postgres, we had uh, someone mentioned, was it in the AMA yesterday, that you know, the, new, the statistics features, always good new statistics features in Postgres, we try to bring them to every version. Uh, we have new interesting uh, parts to the statistics system in version 17 as well. Um, well, as I'll just bring this one right back. We also broke this, as I just mentioned. Right? We removed a whole bunch of columns from PG stat BG writer. When you think about it, none of these statistics are actually about the background writer. And that's why they were removed. Instead, we have a PG stat checkpointer and we put them back. So it's not that we took the numbers away, we just moved them so you can't find them. Uh, but the other more important part is, as you can see in this example here, you've got these numbers of time then requested and your times, and you see restart points now get separate statistics. Uh, restart points in simplified being the checkpoints that run on a standby or the checkpoints that run during startup. Um, how many of those are happening and, and uh, splitting those apart into different values. So the old value is BG Writer. Background writer statistics are still in the BG Writer view and checkpointer statistics have basically been moved over to PG stat checkpointer. So again, if you have uh, monitoring tools that are using these, then that's the way to go. Some of the, most of the, um, the other things that were removed here, these buffers, uh, are moved into the PG stat IO view where they were added in, uh, or in 16, but they were just not removed from the PG writer view at the time. Uh, we have some additions to PG stat statements, which I'm hoping you're all using PG stat statements or have a really good reason not to. Uh, one of them is that you can get the local block IO statistics per query. So the local cache in the back end, like temp tables and stuff. Uh, we didn't have the I.O. timing for it. Well, now you have those, local block, read time, and write time. Um, and you get the entry time when a query was first recorded by PG stat statements in its current entry. So the first time will go in, in the stats since. Uh, now, this can be a query. As you know, a PG stat statement tracks a certain amount of statements or a certain number of statements. And a query might leave the statistics and come back Right? because it's no longer in the top 5,000 or whatever you have. And it will have the same query ID, but it will then get a new uh, statistic since, since at that point the statistics are lost. 
There is also a min-max stats since uh, that's related to the fact that you can now choose to reset all the statistics for a query except for the minimum and maximum time. So you keep the minimum and maximum times separate from the other statistics. And at that point, these two numbers can go uh, to different values. If you're not explicitly doing this reset yourself at different times, they will always end up showing the same thing. Uh, the Query jumbling, as it's called in uh, PG stat statements, now properly normalizes call. So if you're using actual stored procedures in previous versions, if you called in this, you, know, you can see I didn't have a stored procedure in my test database, so it's just dummy. But basically, now it can identify that you know the parameters are actually parameters and normalize them to dollar one, dollar two. Whereas in previous versions, they would it would see every call statement as a different statement when it had different parameters. Uh, which can be very annoying because uh, it can rapidly explode and be like half of your PG stat statements or just different versions of, uh, of a call statement. Um, PG stat vacuum progress now shows index progresses. So when you are vacuuming a table, it will not tell you within the individual index how far along it is, but it will tell you. So in this case, I have five indexes, three are done. So it basically takes the face of vacuum and indexes and, and gives us some more detail as it's running to give you a little bit of a clue how much longer you're going to have to wait. Because uh, usually when you're at the point of looking into this, you are waiting, right? Uh, it, was, it was slow enough that you felt the need to look at it. Uh, so that can be a, a nice uh, further input into that one. Okay, leaving statistics. Let's talk about copy. Who's ever seen an error somewhat like this? It goes off, but you know, I copy, I copied my little dummy table from a test file in CSV, and it goes down and it's a like, boom, invalid input syntax for integer. Now, usually, it's not on line two, right? Usually, you've loaded a few million lines, and then it happens. Uh, so, copy in uh, version 17 has gained the ability to direct and act on errors. What you can say here is you can say, see here, copy dummy from format CSV on error ignore. And as I copy it now, it just says one row was skipped due to data type incompatibility, for example. Now in 17, the only on error operation supported is ignore. Uh, but the idea in the future is to be able to do you know, on error log or on error write it to a different table that where every column might be text or like to allow you to uh, proceed through it. In this version, all we can do is just ignore it, but you know, depending on what your data is, that's a good start. Uh, but the, the goal coming, hopefully then in Postgres 18, is to be able to actually send the incompatible data somewhere. Sorry? Sorry, it will be? Any error, yes. Yes, or, or any, I mean, any error that's based on, on the source data. If you run out of disk space, it's, um, you're, you're screwed. But like wrong number of columns or, you know, batting, yeah. Yeah, all, all error or of that type, it will be able to ignore. Yes, Jamie. If one line breaks the rest of the file, I think that uh, that is in the end going to end up how it breaks it. Like if you get like a, a runaway quoted string or something, you know, all bets are off. <laughs> uh, you're, then you're probably just going to fall into a different error later, and uh, yeah. Uh, so it'll depend on on exactly how. But if you do, if if it's single line CSV, one line tends to not break the next one, except possibly for the quoting errors, and and yeah, they're going to go weird. Whatever we do, yes. Uh, no indication of which line, no. Because the idea would be, uh, then you'd have to log like every one of them, and there might be millions of entries. That would be in this upcoming ability to say, for each line, log, uh, which we don't have at this point. OK, speaking of things that were in Postgres 16, and then they were not in Postgres 16, and now they're back. Uh, a new permission that is called the maintenance permission. Uh, you can grant this uh, to a non so to allow somebody who's not the table owner to be able to do things like vacuum, analyze cluster, re-index, and refresh materialized view, unlock table. Uh, why was this removed in Postgres 16? It was removed because we did not have this feature to secure the search path 
for expressional indexes. And in that case, this could have been used to gain higher privileges in the database and to be exploited as a security uh, issue. Therefore, it was removed, the uh, search path lock-in was properly put in, and then it was put back in uh, now that it can be done in a safe way. Uh, and this one works uh, similar, like you can grant maintain on a table to a user, then they will get this permission on the individual table, or you can grant this new uh, role called PG maintain to a user, and then they will get the maintenance permission on every table. So you can create a special user that can run all those lovely vacuums for you. Um, who loves dealing with locales? Okay, cool. Let's add another one. It's not actually another one, but Postgres uh, 17 will come with a built-in locale provider. So, you know, previous versions of Postgres for a few years at least have, been, have had the libc provider and the ICU provider, and now we have a built-in one. So you get a little bit more to choose from. This is only for the C locale for now, so Postgres will just bring its own version of handling the C locale. It is faster than using ICU, it is faster than using glibc, um, the most important part is that it is stable, or at least if it's broken, then we broke it. <laughs> and then we can fix it within Postgres. Uh, it does not, uh, for those of you who don't know, the C locale is the one that basically is not a locale, right? It doesn't sort things correct, but it does sort things consistently. And a lot of the time that's enough, right? Uh, if you're just indexing and texturing and you're looking it up by equals lookups, it doesn't matter which order it's in the in index as long as it's consistent. And that's exactly the problem with particular glibc locales is that they, they're not necessarily consistent. Um, who, ha let's put it, who has been hit by the locale problems in the glibc upgrades? I feel your pain, I've done it too. Who has never heard of the locale issues around glibc upgrades? That's very few people who haven't heard about it. Who thinks they're not affected by these? Okay, it's almost a trick question. If you think you're not affected by them, or, and if you have a, or if you've never heard of them, you should really go to Joe Conway's talk that's right after lunch here. He will talk about the problems in detail that these hold. The built-in uh, locale provider is not a fix, like a, a perfect fix for this. It's a step on the way. Uh, it's infrastructure, but it can be used already right now. Um, Okay, let's move on, take a look at some of the more SQL exposed uh, things and more, maybe a little bit more developer oriented. The things that everyone's always been waiting for, right? You can now actually convert things to binary in Octal. Sweet, isn't it? Was it, I think it was 16 that we added the ability to actually specify literals in binary in Octal, but there was no way to go the other way. Well, now there is. Uh, very simple, but still useful. Uh, if you are dealing with timestamps and intervals, we can now hand, have infinite intervals. This was a little bit weird because we could have infinite timestamps, but not infinite differences between two timestamps. So if you were to compare two timestamps and one was infinite, you would get an error. Uh, now, if you do that, like if you did this, infinity minus now, you now actually get infinity. That's, you know, it's kind of obvious and it's kind of annoying if it crashes when you do that. So, uh, uh, simple addition that just plugs a bunch of holes where previously you had to manually do a you know case when x is in, equals infinity, then return this, else return that. Uh, if you're using partition tables, identity columns now work properly, as we'll say. It has to do with like when you attach and detach tables, you could get into some weird. Uh, positions with identity columns uh, that you don't anymore. Uh, Postgres 17 will support what is officially known as temporal primary keys and unique constraints. This is again one of those things that doesn't technically add any new features to Postgres, uh, but this is part of the SQL standard, uh, and it's a way to deal with uh, any of the SQL standards called temporal keys. Uh, basically, it allows you in this case to create a primary key which has to have and first a column that is not temporal, and then you can say valid without overlaps, where valid is a range type. Now in the SQL standard, they, they talk about periods, which is basically a range type for time, 
or, or timestamps, and they don't support the other kind of range types. In Postgres, this will support all of our range types, but you still have to have one column that is not a range type in it. Uh, and under the hood, this will create an exclusion constraint. Right? And Postgres had exclusion constraints for ranges for a long time, uh, but we couldn't use them as an official primary key. And we couldn't declare them as a unique constraint because they would be an exclusion constraint. Uh, so this is sort of a subset of exclusion constraints that can be declared as this, which will be uh, SQL standard compatible and therefore it'll work in like when you're populating IDEs and uh, data types and things in applications out of it. Yes? Oh, oh I didn't do this. Somebody else will do this. <laughs> Yep, the, there are, we'll see. We're, we're slowly moving towards this, so piece by piece. Yes? So, if I query the table, will it specify the value or So, yeah, so this, this, this part only gives us the key, the, the ability to use this as a primary and unique key. The SQL standard also has the ability, we can say, you know, select this as, you know, as of a certain time. Uh, we don't have that syntax yet. So today, if you just query it by ID today, you will get all the rows back and, and look at it. So you, yeah, in, in, in reality, you need to also do the where clause on the validity time. How many cookies are needed to fix this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. It is, prog progress is ongoing. There are patches out there for the actual uh, code to do as of time, uh, they're not done yet. Uh, but, you know, 18 or 19, hopefully, they're, they're actively being developed. Yes? Time travel was in Postgres and we took it out. The problem with that was that time travel in Postgres was not optional <laughs> and it was ridiculously slow. But yes, some of the things that you are doing in, in these temporal parts of SQL really they're solving the same problem that, that Postgres and Illustra did back in those days, yes. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, there is now a new function in libpq called pq change password. I bet most of you aren't really using libpq, but again, this becomes infrastructure that can be used by most other drivers that are sitting on top of it. This functionality used to be in PSQL. Oh, uh, in PSQL in the client, it's now moved into the driver, which will then hopefully make it available to the other ones. What it will do is it will make you stop putting alter user set password or create user password and put the password that will then drop out in log files and things like that. This is the equivalent of the backslash password function uh, in PSQL, which will you know encrypt the passwords properly and so that what goes in your log files is not a clear text password. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll have to wait a little bit to see this bubble up into the next layer drivers, uh, but at least now they're available uh, to do that and, and uh, avoid leaking too much of the passwords into the log files. Now, obviously leaking the passwords into the log files is only a small part of the problem. Uh, you still need to treat your Postgres log files as uh, security sensitive data because there can be a lot of other security sensitive stuff that ends up in the log file at some point. Uh, certainly at the application level, uh, security sensitive stuff. Uh, the JSON path support in Postgres has been substantial. I'll temporarily use this one. There we go. <coughs> so yeah, so um, JSON path has gained a whole bunch of new operators, which mostly are, I say converting between and then put data types within double quotes because really JSON doesn't really have data types. You can convert between uh, timestamps and things inside of JSON path. Like you can convert to strings, you can turn a string into a boolean and things to be used in the uh, JSON path query language uh, inside of it as well. Uh, so again, there is no sort of really revolutionary JSON path functionality. It's just chipping away at the small missing parts to gain uh, full compatibility and to give you the, the full power of the JSON path language. 
That's me. Oh, well, it was someone. Okay. Let's talk backup and replication. I, well, everybody loves replication. Everybody hates backups, right? I think that's the usual. Uh, we've got uh, a fair amount of good stuff in both of these cases that I think are uh, quite exciting. First of all, I start with PG dump because it's neither backups nor replication. But it is dumps and they're still useful. Right? Uh, the new thing in PG dump is you can now specify a list of what you want to do in a file instead of in a massively long command line. So in this example here, I say, you know, include table foo, include table bar, include with a wildcard in a schema, but exclude the data for this particular table, making it just the schema dump. Like you could do all of this on the PG dump command line before, but once you start adding a few number of tables here, that becomes very, very unmaintainable. Uh, so it's useful in that way, and you just add a filter. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the other microphone. There we go. Yes, still works. New batteries, we're back at it. It's like one of those, you know, the Formula One pit stops, right? It's about the same thing. So as I said, PG dump, a uh, great tool, not backups. What is a good backup tool? PG base backup is a pretty good backup tool, right? Uh, at least if you're... Uh, can live with the limitations that it has. One of the limitations it's had is that it can only do full backups. Well, uh, no more. PG base backup in 17 can do incremental base backups. Yes? So I agree wholeheartedly that our documentation should not, should not say that PG dump is a backup tool, but uh, I will continue to fight this windmill. <laughs> it's a hard fight. Everyone don't agree. They're wrong. Uh, so PG uh, base backup now can do incremental backup. Uh, what does this mean? Well, it will backup, compared to the previous backup, only those disk blocks that are changed. Uh, which hopefully means that your backups will be, be much smaller. I mean, that's the idea. If the entirety of your database gets changed between two backups, there is no point in using an incremental backup. Then you should just use a regular full backup. Now, the way that this works in PG base backups, you've already known, if, if anyone in here is using PG backrest, you know you've been able to do incremental backups in PG backrest for many years. Uh, and they were used to be at the uh, granularity of a gigabyte file. And then they added block level incremental backups a couple of years back. Uh, but still, the PG backrest way of doing it is it reads the whole files and basically compares the checksums to figure out what has changed. Uh, PG base backup create, has a new process in Postgres called a while summarizer, which you have to turn on. You say summarize while equals on. It'll start another background process that basically listens to the transaction log, the while process and picks out of it and say, oh, this block has changed, oh, this block has changed, oh, this block has changed, and generate summarizer files that PG base backup can then use and say, okay, well, from this to this, here is a list of all the blocks that have changed, because you can get that information from the while, and then it will back up those specific blocks. So the difference can be said that when you run the actual incremental backup with PG base backup, it's faster, it uses a lot less uh, power of your machine because it doesn't have to read all the data. Instead, you have this well summarizer that runs all the time that costs you a little bit of performance all the time versus more performance at the one time. Uh, which one's gonna be the best? I have no idea. I don't, I, we need a lot of, of more real world experience before we can figure out exactly uh, which one's gonna be right and wrong. I'm pretty sure it's gonna depend on the scenario, right? In some scenarios, the backrest method's gonna be faster. In some scenarios, this one's gonna be faster. Then you set, you can set a parameter called while summary keep time, which tells basically this while summary, so how much data should I keep around? Default is 10 days. That means you can do incremental backups going back for 10 days. So for example, if you do a full backup once a day, you can do incremental every day, and you're fine with 10 days. But if you do a full backup every two weeks, you don't leave this at 10 days or you will have no backups. <laughs> yes? Yes, yes. PG, PG based backup is always a binary backup. Um, and that's one of the reasons, like, you, you couldn't do this uh, on a logical dump. It, it has to be on the binary backups. 
Uh, and the idea here, of course, when you then, so you run your first backup, you just run a regular base backup, PG base backup, give a directory. When you then run your second one, you run PG base backup, and you say dash dash incremental equals, and you point to the backup manifest of your previous backup. So if you point it back to the full backup, it will back up all the differences since the full backup. You can also point it to your previous incremental backup, at which point you'll, you'll get a chain of incremental backups uh, that will work. And then in the rest, you just tell it to, okay, write this one over here, uh, and it will read the manifest, get the wall data out of that, go talk to the wall summarizer, and figure out which blocks have been changed in between them. Now to restore this, when you restore a general PG base backup, right, it's very easy, you just copy the files back and you're done. Uh, that obviously doesn't work when you're doing them incremental. So for this, there's a new tool called PG Combine Backup, where you just say, you know, PG Combine Backup into this directory, use the full backup and then the incremental backup. Then what goes here in the combined will be exactly what it would have looked like if the incremental backup had been a full one. Like it'll uh, put them all together. Uh, and if you have multiple ones, you can just add them, like a whole bunch of, you can have a long chain of things. If you had incremental every day, you want to back up to Thursday, well, you start from the full and then Monday incremental, Tuesday incremental, and et cetera. And it will go through them all and, and generate one output that is then the one that you just restore as you did a full backup directly. Yes. Yes. Can you restore them directly? Yes, you can point PG, like you can combine the, um, this slash backup slash combine could be, you know, your var lib pgsql data if you have cleaned it out first or if you're restoring it to a brand new uh, somewhere. Yes. So if a block has been, like if the block is in both the full and both of the incrementals, for example, will it be written more than once? Uh, I don't know. I would guess it's probably written more than once. Uh, but so I think what it is, if it's, so in this while summarizer, it will get written, um, it'll, uh, it'll get written multiple times, but it generates basically a bitmap where it's only listed once. Because, uh, so it's only listed once there, but if it's in, I don't think the combined backup tool uh, is smart enough because it would potentially need a very large amount of memory to keep track of that. So I think this one will just write it multiple times. But I am not certain. So, yes. Yep. So, yeah, so the, the wall summarizer is uh, only needed to take the incremental backup, not to restore it. So when you're running this backup command, if I'm pointing this to the full backup, then I need the wall summarizer to cover the time back there. But if I had this scenario, then when I took this incremental backup, that would point to the full backup. But this incremental backup points to this backup. So at that point, when, when this one is taken, the wall summarizer only needs to have the data back to the here. And then it will follow the chain across in the restore. Yes? Uh, to start from a new full backup, I believe you need a new base backup to like start a new, completely new chain. But you can have an, an you know, um, there's no limit on how long your chain can be only, of course, it will take longer to restore the more you have uh, changes in there. Yes? Yeah, exactly. I, I th yeah, the I, I think also the question was, can you use the combined as a full backup? I don't think you can, but again, I'm not sure. It might be possible, but I don't think you can at this point. Okay, so let's leave backups. This is, I mean, PG dump is not backups. Some people think it is. Replication is definitely not uh, that. What about upgrades? They're somewhere in between, but uh, there are some interesting things. Uh, Postgres 17 will be able to preserve subscriptions fully across upgrades. So when you PG upgrade today, all your logical replication subscriptions go boom, and you have to start over. You will no longer have to do that. You will be able to upgrade without rebuilding your subscribers. That's kind of neat, right? 
Of course, you will only be able to upgrade from version 17 because it's, it's required on, on uh, that side as well. But, you know, we like to prepare for the future. Uh, for now, you're still in, in the, you need a new node that runs version 17 and logically replicate into this node. Uh, but this is one of those things. Another classic issue uh, with uh, the logical replication is when you're combining logical and physical replication, right? You have a, a high availability cluster for something that publishes logical replication, it fails over and now everything breaks. Uh, to do that, Postgres 17 adds replication slot synchronization between the nodes. So it basically means between physical replicas, you can synchronize your logical replication slots. So today, your, uh, replica the source of your replication publication really is an individual node. But with this, you can conceptually make it your HA cluster be. Now, to do that, you need uh, multiple different things. You need to enable something called failover on each replication slot. That's either done when you're manually doing PG create logical replication slot, if you're, you might be using this for something that is not Postgres on the receiver side, or when you say create subscription, you just give it a flag failover on. Then you need to enable sync replication slots on all of your standbys so that they will be receiving this data. Um, and then you need to configure standby slot names on the system as well, because that's for Postgres to know that it has to wait for these synchronous uh, workers that run on the standbys to get the data before it's allowed to invalidate the data out of the slot. Otherwise, the problem would be if your logical replication runs faster than your physical replication, it, and then you failed over, you would be broken again. Now, usually logical replication does not run faster than physical replication, but you could have a temporary hiccup on the network to one of your standbys or something. So you do need to set all of these, and what will happen in practice is that this, uh, the sync replication slots, when you turn this on, it'll start an extra background worker that will just periodically uh, synchronize the state of these so that when you do a failover, your uh, subscribers can just connect to the new primary, and what data they needed will still be there. Okay, let's talk a little bit about performance. We all love performance. Postgres is almost, almost always faster in the newer version. Uh, you will always be able to find something that's slower. Uh, but as a general rule, there are, as usual, there are a lot of uh, infrastructure features uh, that are really interesting to Postgres hackers, the giving access to you know, new types of, of uh, structures for arranging tables internally in memory and things like that. Uh, we don't necessarily care about those as an end user. To an end user, to us, it just looks like things are running faster. And that's great. We love it. Uh, singling out a couple of specific ones, uh, copy can be made significantly faster. Uh, I think the numbers are, so one interesting one is specifically if you're copying data out, there's a function called UUID out that's called every time you write a UUID out as string. And if you, have a sim, if you have the specific case of a single table with just a new UID column and everything is in cache and you copy it out, it's now 60% faster. Like that's a, a non-trivial speed up. And obviously you don't have quite that ideal case in, in reality, but it will be much faster. And also simple things like if you're actually using copy two, uh, it would, uh, Postgres would actually convert the encoding from the, from itself to itself, if the codings were the same, it didn't uh, realize that they were different. It does now. So copy two in encoding cases will also just simply be faster. Some of the more advanced things that are, are getting in there is something called self-join removal, uh, which basically means if you run a query where you join a table to itself on, say, the primary key in the simplest case, and you just query one column from each of those two tables, that join is completely unnecessary, right? Because you can just read both columns without joining in the table. Uh, and Postgres will now detect a lot of cases where this happens and just remove the join and get the column from the one scan of the table instead. Uh, this is, I mean, you can look at it and go, like, the answer for a long time has been, well, just fix your query. Like, don't do that stupid join, right? But a lot of us are stuck in cases where we have automatically generated queries. They are ORM queries or reporting system-generated queries. Uh, and now Postgres will just, just detect this, remove the join, uh, and it'll run faster. 
Another thing that I think, uh, and I was looking, I, I was even surprised myself, I was going through the commit messages and I read this and I found what I think is the best part of this feature in like the fourth paragraph in the commit message, the sort of a side note thing. Um, and this is, Postgres will now deal with redundant, not null calls, as it's called, much more efficiently. So just setting the stage here, I, I'm, if I create a table here, I have a single column, it's not null, I insert a thousand values, right? Uh, whichever I do there. If I run this query on that in Postgres 16, you know, explain, select star from foo where A is null, right? Oh, sorry, where, where A is not null. That's kind of a, we know that A is not null. It's defined, right? Here's how Postgres 16 will run this query. And I also realized this is a different test data because that was 1,000 rows and this was run with 10,000 rows, but it works the same way. Now, if I run this one on Postgres 17, it runs like that. You know, that's a pretty simple thing, right? We no longer need this filter. No, it's gone. We can just scan the table. We know that every row will match. Uh, now, this is not actually the part of this one that I find cool, but this is the part that's, uh, you know, the headline feature for this. Uh, what if we run the query like this? Select star from foo where A is null. There is a not null constraint on this table. How does Postgres run this in Postgres version 16? Well, it runs a sequential scan across the table, filter A is null. How does Postgres 17 run this query? One time filter false result. <laughs> this, the, again, auto-generated queries often don't realize this. In fairness, uh, my queries might also very well include things like this every now and then. But I've seen it many times coming out of systems that are auto-generated queries of an ORM system where it literally does an is-null query where we know that can't happen. And now we'll just detect that and not run it. Uh, so I, I actually think this <laughs> is the more important part than this. <laughs> but, you know, they're both good, obviously, and, and avoiding any work that we can avoid based on the fact that we have declarative constraints. And again, this is yet another reason that you should remember to put those pesky not null constraints on your columns. <laughs> Not only because once you get nulls in there, everything bugs out when you didn't expect it, it will also run faster. <laughs> That's an easier sell. Uh, most versions of Postgres include some enhancements to the parallelism. It's not too much around the parallelism in 17, but you can now uh, create index, can now be parallelized for Brin indexes. Uh, previously, you, if you were creating in a Brin index, it would only use one CPU. Now it works the same way as Btree, where it'll use uh, maximum parallel maintenance workers, number of uh, workers, to create brain indexes as well. Um, the SLRU caches, does anyone know what SLRU caches are in Postgres? Okay, a couple of people, pretty much all of them are Postgres hackers. And you know what they are, do you also know what they mean? It's, a, it's actually, that part is much simpler, it simply means simple LRU, so simple least recently used cache. They're just like separated special caches. The thing is there's been like one, and now they're all divided up into separate cache banks. That's not supposed to be an I there. They're just divide cache in banks uh, with, with separate lockings, and you can now configure each one of these separate SLRU caches uh, to a different size if you need to. And these are things like, you know, multi x acts in Postgres, uh, transaction ID caches, these like very low level uh, caches can be configured individually. This is the same. Uh, we already had something called pgstat SLRU, which will tell you things like the cache hit ratio across the different parts of it, uh, but you couldn't actually control it before. And now in 17, you will be able to override the defaults uh, for these cache sizes. Uh, and control them specifically. Now, obviously, like most of those things, it, like most of you are probably not going to have to do that. Uh, but particularly on like really heavily loaded system in with high concurrencies, uh, increasing some of these caches is going to make a uh, potentially a substantial difference uh, around the things we're doing. Uh, so that's the list of things that I am planning to go through. There's obviously always more, and specifically now that we're only about halfway through the final commit fest, there will be more things. Uh, there are more things already now that I just decided not to include because, again, what was it, 16, thousands of commits. Uh, there will definitely be more. There are many, many smaller things. There are performance improvements uh, all over the place. There's no way to go through them all. But this is also the perfect time for you to help out. 
right? We haven't released it yet. We haven't even put the beta out there yet. But you can actually get both uh, RPM and YUM and apt packages of the snapshot versions. You can put them on your systems and you can run them. Maybe not in production. I mean, you can. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but like, if you have testing systems, if you have automated tests, please throw Postgres 17 at them and see what happens. Let us know if something broke. Uh, do you have performance tests for your applications? Run them against Postgres 17. Hopefully everything will be faster. Maybe it won't. If you can let us know that now rather than after the release, the likelihood of this getting fixed before the release increases drastically. So please do download these. Uh, help us run these tests. Let us know how it works out. Yes? Uh, yes, I believe these packages are assert enabled. Uh, Devrim says yes for the RPMs. Do you know if that's true for the Debian packages as well? Okay. I it's difficult to compare performance straight up between them in that case. Yes, that is true. But but yeah, and and you can compare plans, and you can certainly compare the fact that things work, <laughs> that your data comes back the right way. Uh, but yes, that, that is a very good point, that from a performance perspective, they're not compiled with exactly the same switches as the uh, production builds. So you can't do a direct comparison between those. So yeah, please do grab us those. Uh, help us out with the testing. Help us out reporting what works and what doesn't work. Uh, you are the ones who have the real-world applications. Uh, our tests are mostly done on you know, uh, synthetic workloads. We need to see this with real workloads. Uh, and once you've done that, hopefully we will have a Postgres 17 ready for you after summer. With that, I thank you very much. I think we're all running out. <laughs> we're all running out to get to lunch. I guess I have about two more minutes if we have any questions uh, for now. And if not, you can always catch me in the hallways later. Uh, anyone? Okay, then off to lunch it is. Thank you.